Every elementary school student knows about the Underground Railroad, but there were other roads to freedom. Today, we're visiting the River Road African American Museum, which exhibits the story of freedom seeking and survival in the Deep South. Unique, mysterious, untamed. These are just a few words that describe Louisiana's Atchafalaya Basin. I'm Caroline Byrne, Assistant Director for the Atchafalaya National Heritage Area. Join me on an adventure through the wild and rich culture and landscape of the Atchafalaya, America's foreign country. America's Foreign Country is produced by the Atchafalaya National Heritage Area with support from the Louisiana Office of Cultural Development, the Office of the Lieutenant Governor, and the Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. The mission of the Atchafalaya National Heritage Area is to preserve and promote the Atchafalaya's unique heritage by fostering progress for local champions that create authentic, powerful connections between people, culture, and the environment. This is America's Foreign Country. Every elementary school student knows about the Underground Railroad. A network of refuges instead of a network of train tracks, the Underground Railroad was developed 30 years before the Civil War and designed to lead enslaved persons from the South to the free northern states. Louisiana was one such southern state with a secret network designed to bring enslaved people to freedom. The River Road African American Museum in Donaldsonville helps tell the story of the Underground Railroad in Louisiana through the museum and the Freedom Garden. Here's the museum's founder, Kathy Hambrick. My name is Kathy Hambrick, and I am the founder of the River Road African American Museum that is currently located in Donaldsonville, Louisiana at 406 Charles Street. I created the museum that opened in March of 1994, 28 years ago, to pay homage to the enslaved people who worked on the plantations in this region known as sugarcane plantation country that is also within the petrochemical corridor between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. I decided to name the museum River Road African American Museum because at the same time there was a national program going on to study, it was a feasibility study to um, explore the culture, history, heritage, and geography of the lower Mississippi Delta along the road that what they call the Great River Road um, throughout the lower Mississippi Delta. I wanted to make sure, because America's sugarcane industry started in this region below, I'd say, Point Capit Parish, down through West Baton Rouge Parish, Iverville Parish, Ascension, St. James, St. Uh, Charles, St. John, and then down the, through Bayou Road parishes of Assumption to Lafouche and Terrebonne. So um, this was the largest sugarcane producing region in the world at one time. And, um, well, I, I would say, <laughs> I think Brazil has always been a leader in sugarcane of course, the Caribbean, the Caribbean islands producing sugarcane, later uh, Hawaii and Florida and some of Texas producing sugarcane. But certainly the largest sugarcane plantations in America were located in this region between Point Capi and New Orleans. So, um, as I said before, it was created with the mission of educating the public about the history and culture of the African and African-American people who worked in this region known as the rural communities along the Mississippi River. So the museum mission is to um, preserve the history and the legacy of the enslaved and free, free people, African, <laughs> 
and African Americans in all of the rural river parishes. And I want to say thank you to the Atchafalaya National Heritage uh, Commission. I want to say thank you to you. Um, you have been, your organization has been a friend of the museum. So I really, really appreciate the opportunity to apply for the grant, uh, the funding that you've provided for us for the Freedom Garden has just been a resource that I hope we can continue our relationship. I want to say also that I started my own company last year, and I'm now an independent museum consultant, preservationist, and public historian and speaker. So I offer my services through my company called To Preserve. That's the number two, all capital letters, Preserve. And so because I've had so many museums call upon museums and other organizations call upon me um, for advice and assistance over the years, I offer my services not only as a consultant contracted by the River Road African American Museum, but I'm also now able to offer my services as a consultant to other organizations and institutions who would like to develop programs, events, gardens, festivals, and um, to include or have a more diverse and inclusive way of telling the stories of their community. You mentioned the Freedom Garden. I thought that was a really unique part of your museum, not only that it was a community garden, which is a great way to kind of activate the community and bring people together, but also because of the story it told. So can you kind of talk through how that that idea came about, how it evolved, um, maybe tell people a little bit about what they could learn by visiting? Yeah, so as I developed and researched the story of uh, the enslaved people at the plantations in Ascension Parish back 25 years ago, I was made aware of the National Park Service's Network to Freedom program. And the Network to Freedom was created by the National Park Service to better document and support organizations and communities that were telling the story of the Underground Railroad. So it dawned on me in all of my lifetime of studies, (laughs) and I have um, an undergraduate degree in um, English with a minor in African and African American studies and a master's in museum studies, it dawned on me that I'd never really heard about the Underground Railroad in Louisiana. So I, I focused for about About three years, I was looking at the slave narratives, the infamous uh, slave narratives of the WPA era of the 1930s. And I started to look closely at those narratives, looking for stories of the referencing runaways in Louisiana. And I decided to develop a curriculum guide for teachers using the information that I researched. And you think about the Underground Railroad, what we all typically learn about the Underground Railroad. Of course, we all know, you know, about Harriet Tubman. Most of those stories generated from southern states like South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, Florida, Maryland, Virginia. But there are a number of people like Solomon Northrup. When you think about Solomon Northrup and the book 12 Years a Slave, he was kidnapped uh, from Philadelphia, brought to Louisiana, worked on a sugar and cotton plantation. And then it took him, you know, 12 years to prove his freedom. And that's a freedom story. So the Park Service, what the Park Service taught us all around the world, looking at stories of self-liberation and the Underground Railroad, is that we needed to start to think out of the box. The Underground Railroad is not just a story of abolition or abolitionists 
and hiding out in secret places, in in houses, caves, or in the woods to to find your way to freedom. And the route to freedom was not always a route from the south to the north. If you were seeking freedom as an enslaved person, particularly in Louisiana, we find evidence that there were people stowing away on riverboats. So the river itself was a route to freedom. It wasn't a land route. So as I was developing this curriculum guide that was funded by, my research was funded by the Network to Freedom, I started to talk to teachers. Teachers started bringing children on tours to the museum. I'm talking about Head Start classes, started showing them to the museum. First, second, third graders, middle schoolers, high schoolers. Uh, we had an influx of interest about the Louisiana Underground Railroad in my research. And I would say this was about 2002. And one of the students that came to the museum, and I I think it was just before Katrina asked me the question, well, what did they eat? It's such a South Louisiana question. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, yeah. I mean, this, this seven-year-old child asked me, he says, well, okay, I get it. You know, yeah, we all, we, all people want to be free. I understand why they left. And he said, well, what would they eat? <laughs> and I never really thought about that before. So I knew that Harriet Tubman's father taught her which plants were poisonous in the wilderness. So she knew which berries to eat, which leaves she could eat. She knew what was medicinal plants, and she knew what was edible in the wilderness. And her father taught her these things when she was a child so that if ever or whenever she decided to run away, she would know uh, how to sustain herself in the woods. So a light went off in my head, and I talked to my colleagues at the National Park Service with the Network to Freedom, and I came up with the idea for the garden. And so I said the purpose of the Freedom Garden would be to educate the public about the Underground Railroad in South Louisiana and to educate children about how the enslaved people, who we call freedom seekers, sustain themselves on their journey to freedom. So that meant also that they might take plants or fruits from, that were growing around the plantation, either from the plantation garden or, you know, fruit trees that were growing um, in, uh, in South Louisiana before emancipation. This research led me to Dan Gill, who is one of the lead agricultural specialists and horticulturalists at the time at LSU. And um, I asked Dan, I said, well, Dan, I put together this list based upon my research. I said, but I really need to make sure that these plants that I want in this exhibit garden actually grew in Louisiana prior to the end of the Civil War. So together he and I came up with, he came, gave me a checklist, gave me a list. And um, then the next question was, okay, were these plants that grew in the wilderness or were they domesticated plants? So I had to do all of this research. The Park Service decided to fund our project. And that's when we built the first raised beds, or whether, you know, with the beds at first were not raised beds, they were at, at ground level. We put the fencing up and we started to buy the plants and the trees and the exhibit panels, which you still see today that are renewed. And thanks to your grant, we were able to enhance them with new panel tops and poetry along the fence line. So now when children come, children and adults come, they can learn about Louisiana's journey to freedom, and we call it a reading garden, and that's why we have the exhibit panels and poetry on the fence, and we encourage children to read 
allows, and we encourage elders and youth from the community to volunteer to care for the garden. And then any of the products that we grow, they then can take home to enjoy in recipes and, and dishes at the table of their homes from wherever they may visit around the area. One thing we learned from the Freedom Garden is about maroon communities. To escape, enslaved people could go to cities where they would attempt to pass as free, or they could attempt the journey to the free northern states. For those slaves that sought freedom on their own terms and to establish their own communities where no one had control over them, they would escape to the swamps and wilderness of Louisiana. These groups were typically small, usually no more than 20 or so people. They established these communities in uninhabited swamps and forests, often around the plantation where they were enslaved, because militias and plantation owners were often more hesitant to journey into those wild places. And the conditions were dangerous. Maroons had to contend with disease-carrying mosquitoes and wild animals like alligators and bears. They would sometimes have to wade into water that reached their necks. It was not easy, but freedom without having to conform to the bounds of existing societies was worth it for these groups. And their struggle and triumph plainly demonstrates the resilience and spirit of the enslaved peoples in Louisiana. So something else that I learned from your museum and the garden and going on your website are about maroon communities. And I'd never heard the term before. Can you speak a little bit to those for people like me that have never heard of these types of communities? So maroon, you know, maroon community, maroon, when you look at the primary source documents, when you look at old newspaper ads, uh, when someone ran away from a plantation, the plantation owner would advertise in the newspaper and offer a reward for those persons running away. And as people would run away from the plantations here in South Louisiana, they would find themselves sometimes in the swamp or isolated in a wooded area or forest. And they would then form their own little community of runaways who lived in these isolated swamps and wooded areas. And sometimes they weren't very far from the plantation. So these communities were called maroon and also in Jamaica, you see references in throughout the Caribbean, also in some other parts of South America, you see that they are referred to as maroon communities in the mountains. As a matter of fact, for those of you who have heard or know anything about Rastafarians, who were the first group of people to popularize locking your hair, dread dread locking your hair in the Caribbean, they lived in the mountains of Jamaica, and they their history is tied very closely to enslaved people who left and went into the mountains to find their freedom and, and were isolated. So, again, children will ask me, well, you said they weren't very far from the plantation, so how did they maintain themselves out there, and why didn't the plantation owners just go and round them all up and go and get them. Well, in some cases that happened, but in some cases they were able to arm themselves and protect themselves in the wilderness. And they were able to fish, crawfish, <laughs> hunt, and know what to eat and what not to eat. And the plantation owners just didn't want to waste time anymore going after them. And, um, the, you know, one of the most famous maroon communities in South Louisiana was a community established by a man named San Milo down below New Orleans in the waterways near uh, Lake Bourne. And um, I think at one time the Park Service, either State Parks or the National Park Service, was looking to put a marker down there in the community or that area of the swamp where San Malo and I think it was uh, close to 60, 
60 to 100 people live for years, years and years and years. And you can learn more about San Malo in Gwendolyn Midlow Hall's book, Africans in Colonial Louisiana. It's quite a fascinating story. And it's the first time I was introduced to what a maroon community was. So maroon just means a community of people who live together in the wilderness, whether it be mountain, swamp, or wooded area, who have left the plantation and found freedom in that refuge. So what does the future look like for the River Road African American Museum? What's kind of on the horizon for y'all? Well, I must give thanks to our stakeholders. And our stakeholders being organizations that help fund us, like the Atchafalaya National Heritage Commission, the National Park Service. I mean, the state of Louisiana, we get a little bit of funding. The city of Donisonville, our board of directors, and of course, my family, including my brother who you met, Daryl Hambrick, who is now serving as the executive director as we seek funding to restore the buildings that you saw when you visited. So the Rosenwald School that we successfully moved across the Mississippi River from St. James Parish to Ascension Parish, thanks to Shell Oil Company, is now being completed. The interior is being completed. That Rosenwald School becomes our program area for after-school programs, Saturday programs, and for our summer camp. And also where we plan to develop a listening room where we will be having small indoor concerts and lectures. So the Freedom Garden, the next phase of the Freedom Garden, and you'll get another grant from us soon. (laughs) The next phase of the Freedom Garden is to build an outdoor kitchen. So that way we can teach children You know, right now, there's a big concern about food deserts. There's a concern about childhood obesity and diabetes. How do we teach Americans as a whole how to eat better, have more vegetables and fruits in their diet? So we want to complete our landscape with more fruit trees, make sure that we're able to grow the vegetables and fruits all around the property of the Rosenwald School. And then we'll have an outdoor kitchen where we can do outdoor cooking classes with the young people who who come to visit and who are involved in our program. So I'd love to get your opinion on what you think Ascension Parish adds to the overall cultural, natural resource story of the Atchafalaya National Heritage Area. I said this as I went to one of the task force or one of the preliminary meetings that they were having as they were uh, establishing the heritage, uh, a Chaffalai heritage area. And so in the very beginning, I saw Ascension Parish was included. I was all excited. And then I noticed over the years, all of a sudden, I didn't get any more communications about it. And I was told that Ascension Parish was not included in the Chapalaya Heritage Area. How can you not have Donisonville in the Chapalaya area when Bayou Lafouche enters the Mississippi River at Donisonville Mm -hmm. and through Ascension Parish on that, particularly on that west side of the river with Bayou Lafouche being a tributary closely connected with the Atchafalaya. On the east bank of the river, it seems to me any of these areas connected to the Mississippi River with tributaries in South Louisiana are running one way or another from the Atchafalaya into the Mississippi River. And you can't tell a more complete story by leaving Ascension Parish out of that story. When we were the largest sugarcane producing area in the state, and also we were a rice producing area of the state, and Donaldsonville being the capital of the state, 
and the parish seat for Ascension Parish since the beginning. Uh, it was the capital in 1830. How could you leave one of the capital cities of Louisiana out of your Atchafalaya heritage region with such an important story about the agriculture and the rivers that flow through it? Absolutely. Is there anything else you'd like people to know, anywhere you want people to follow the museum, whether it's on social or a website? Do you have any events coming up you want to share? Yes. So um, I will I would like to direct people to our website because we have so many programs going on, particularly since the beginning of the year. We've been doing a series of African-American genealogy workshops. So you'll be able to go online to uh, the website. You can get to Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and also join our email list. We have an exhibit that was funded by the Social Science Research Council of America. And the exhibit is about the enslaved people who were sold by the Jesuit priests of Georgetown and purchased by... Henry S. Johnson, who was a lawyer in Donisonville, who became the fifth governor of Louisiana. He was a sugar planter, a judge, lawyer, and senator. And we will be unveiling with a program and reception, unveiling the names of those enslaved people who were brought to Ascension Parish to the Chatham Plantation with an absolutely beautiful artist exhibit with stained glass images produced by Malika Favorite and a unveiling a sculpture which has been donated by a New Jersey artist who visited us and also to tell the story of those individuals who ended up enslaved in Ascension Parish from Maryland from Georgetown University. Information for this episode came from WWNO and National Geographic. Special thanks to Kathy Hambrick for speaking with me today. Our music is by Jordan Thibodeau at La Rodaille with permission from Valcor Records. The National Heritage Area Program is a partnership with the National Park Service. NHAs are designated by Congress as areas that tell nationally significant stories through natural, cultural, and historic resources. Designated in 2006, the goal of the Atchafalaya National Heritage Area is to preserve and promote the natural, recreational, and cultural resources surrounding the Atchafalaya River and its basin. For more information about the Atchafalaya National Heritage Area, visit www.achafalaya.org. That's www.achafalaya.org. You can learn more about the Louisiana Office of Cultural Development at crt.state.la.us slash cultural development. Support for this show comes from the Louisiana Office of Cultural Development, the Office of the Lieutenant Governor, and the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism.